Lord, my God, we come before you. God, you know the challenges that we face this year. Lord, we're thankful for a new year, for opportunities, for new, new joys, new aspirations, Lord. Lord God, I love when the new, fall, new snow falls because everything just seems so fresh and so bright. And the darkness, the dinginess of what was before is covered. Lord God, the whiteness that comes from your, your love and your, your cleansing Holy Spirit is even better than that fresh new snow. Lord God, you have promised to wash us white. Would you be with us? Help us to see the areas that have gotten a bit dingy. Help us to submit those areas to you. Lord God, I know that there are things that I wish I had done better. I'm so thankful that you don't hold those things against us, but you encourage us to walk forward with your strength. You give us that strength to continue. Lord, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us in the various trials that we're facing. Some emotional, some relational, some spiritual, Lord God. In the end, you're the one that can mend those hurts. Lord, you can heal the bruises. I pray that you would be with us and that you would truly mend our hearts, Lord God. Help us to hear your voice in the midst of the chaos. Lord, I ask that you would be with Pastor Rick as he comes to, to teach your word and to speak to our hearts. Would you anoint him with your Holy Spirit and give him the words to speak? Help us to hear your voice, Lord God. Be with us this morning. Amen. Good morning. Happy New Year. I'm not a New Year's resolution, resolution person. I can't even say the word. But I wanted to share a few that I found that may be a little funny to us. I'm going to sign up for a marathon that I bravely will not actually run. This one's tragic, but true to go outside among people and then to relearn all the social cues that I lost staying at home for a year. Unfriend every person who shares unsolicited, unsolicited diet or exercise regimes. And to go along with that, find a more accurate scale. I looked at mine this morning. I don't want to see it again. Stop buying toilet paper, just in case. I already have a room full. To read more. Or at least to turn on the subtitles, subtitles while I'm watching TV. Floss every day. And not just wild with wild abandon on the week leading up to my first cleaning. Here's one for you kids. 
eat only white snow. To be a little nicer to people who do exactly what I want. To stop hanging out with people who make New Year's resolutions. For most people, resolu resolutions are good for only one thing, guilt. Very few of us change our life pattern just because the calendar changes numbers. What, what true, true change requires is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. This morning we are not going to look at resolutions, but at the power of God to change our lives through fellowship with him. Let's look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11, starting with verse 1 and going through verse 44. I know it's a lot, and I'm not going to have you stand as I read it so that you don't faint and get tired standing up. John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Remember that so. Remember that so. So he stayed where he was for two more days. Now, so when he heard that Jesus Lazarus was sick, he stayed there for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were tired, were, were, were there, tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is with, so it is with a person who walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After, they, after he said this, he went on to tell, tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of Lazarus' death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus, is dead and for your sake I am glad I was not there so you may believe but let us go to him then Thomas also known as Didymus said to the rest of the disciples let us also go that we may die with him on his arrival Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brothers. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they, are, they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. 
after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, and he's asking for you. Then Mary heard this. She got up and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Notice Jesus hadn't gone anywhere. He's not in any big hurry, is he? When the Jews who had been with Jesus in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then Jesus saw, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of the Jews said, he could not, could he not have, who, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, after the sister, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been dead for four days. And G then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew you always heard me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and cloths around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes. Let him go. Praise God. Let him go. Jesus desires to share his love with his people. Jesus, in his purpose for our lives and through our lives, is to give glory to God. And the things that block Jesus from doing what he wants to do is us. From seeing what his vision, what Jesus wants. Jesus desires to share his love with us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the creator of the universe wants to share his love with you? This is where you say amen. <laughs> Thank you. He wants to share his love with you. Jesus desires to share his love with his people. The one who is sick, the one you love, is sick. John identifies himself as a disciple that Jesus loved. I've had discussions with people about this point. Was John particularly loved by the Savior? Or was John in such disbelief that he could be loved by the Creator? that he kept pointing out the fact that Jesus loved him. Are you, are we absolutely wowed by the idea that the creator of this universe loves you? Are you absolutely hysterical over the idea that God loves you is it awe-inspiring fresh to you that god of the universe loves you that you can't help but wonder of that fact or have we become so accustomed to jesus presence that we hor horribly take our lord for granted ask yourself that question that the creator of this universe wants to have fellowship with us. 
in John chapter 1, verse 3, he says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The fellowship between John and Jesus is a fellowship that we have. Through the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship with the Father. Are we awe inspired by that, or is that just a humdrum thought? Is it something that we wake up to every day, or just every once in a while when we're going through trouble? And then after we've waded through and sifted through all the problems that we could somehow try to fix, fix ourselves, do we finally come to the conclusion that the God of the universe loves us enough to take care of our problem? Of our next year, of our past year. You see, we have this same intimate relationship with Jesus that John had, that Lazarus had, that Mary and Martha had. If we ask for forgiveness of our sins, we have that relationship. If we follow his commands, we have that relationship. If we follow his commands to love God and to love one another, we have that relationship. As he told us in his word, we we live as Christ's disciples. First, we ask for forgiveness. Second, we follow his command to love one another and to love him above everything else. And then third, we live as Christ's disciples, not just as Christians. It seems to have become a word that fits everybody in anything, that people who come to a service at some time or another in some way in some, and have some kind of a experience but don't follow him they continue to go off on their life living it as they lived before and expecting God to bless them and they call themselves Christians I want to understand I want us to understand we need to be disciples and the disciple is a follower a doer somebody who accomplishes what the master wants are we disciples are we willing to do and to be the things necessary to have that closeness with God are we willing to pray pray without ceasing not, not just the, the, the few minutes you set aside in the morning not, not, not just during the prayer time that we have at service for some, that's the only time they pray through the week. But pray without ceasing. Pray calling out the name and the word of God, asking him for what we need and asking him what he wants and then saying, Lord, give me the power to do it. Are we praying? Are we reading? Not Oprah's latest book. Not the, the latest thing by, by James Dobson. Not the, not the, the words of, of somebody else spoken about on a page about the Word of God, but are we reading the Word of God? And are we allowing it to make a difference in our lives? If he says it, I do it. We'll get into that a little bit later. Is we, are we fellowshipping with God? Is that a strange concept to us? We fellowship with each other. We've had all kinds of parties and all kinds of stuff going on, and, and we fellowship on our Sunday school class or our ABF class, and, and we have that kind of fellowship, but do we have fellowship with God where we just really talk to him and he talks to us and we enjoy each other's company? We have fellowship with the Father. And then we do some, some nasty four-letter word. We obey. Oh, man. That's a hard word. I don't want to do that. It scares me. It changes me. Obey. 
doesn't wait for us to have some great revelation. He says, it's in my word, obey. Obey. And, then, and, and our purpose of our lives changes as we obey. Why we get up in the morning changes. Why we go to bed at night changes. Why we work, why we sleep, why we, why we care for our kids, why we love our husbands or our wives, why we follow changes. It changes from me to him. It changes from I want to, Lord, I'll give you glory. Through COVID, I'll give you glory. Through death, I'll give you glory. Through wellness, I'll give you glory. Through a job change or a job loss, I'll give you glory. Verse 4 of our scripture said, When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Are you willing for God to gain glory? In whatever circumstances is in your life, are you willing to give God the opportunity to be glorified? Or is it just about you still? I'm sick. Lord, take care of me. I'm sick. Lord, glorify. Lord, I lost this person, or this person died, or, or this happened. Take care of it. Lord, glorify yourself. Give yourself glory through me. Verse 6 says it has a big word in it. It's a long word. It's a word that we can't seem to get our minds wrapped around. This says so. So when Jesus heard that Lazarus, Lazarus was sick, what did he do? Did he run to his side and say, oh, poor Mary and Martha? He stayed two more days where he was. He stayed there. So it's, so it's such a large word, large word here. He was informed of the grave sickness that his loved one suffered, yet he, he sowed it. He stayed where he was. Jesus could have ordered the sickness to leave him. The moment he heard about it, he could have said, Lazarus, you're healed. Even from miles away, Jesus could have said, Lazarus, Rise up. You would have been fine. He could have miraculously transported himself to Lazarus' side, healed him, and returned the same way, and the disciples would have never even known he'd left. He had that power. God has that ability. Yet he stayed. He didn't command. He stayed. Why? Why? There are so many ifs in our lives, so many so's in our lives that would say, if God had only done this, if God had only changed us, so if God... So many things this past year, if. If God had healed... God had touched. God could have removed COVID in a moment and none of us would have ever been affected by it. If. If God had only done this or that, how many deaths, losses, hopes, end of dreams would have been stopped? All seemed to have been lost. But the question is, will you accept that God knows what he is 
doing? Will you accept that God knows what he is doing? Will you accept that God knows what he is doing? Or are you going to continue to tell God, hey, if you do it this way, I know you're the maker of the universe, but I know my life. I know that you can wipe out all my sins in a moment, but I can tell you how best to handle this situation. Are we losing out on our supreme Lord? Ridding us of sin because we say we know better? He may have a great adventure for us if we allow him to do his work. He may be bringing someone or even whole families of someone to salvation through your light and momentary trial. Would you be like the people of Israel at the entrance of the promised land who see the obstacles in the way, the size of the giants and the men standing before you and declare that, God, you can't do this? Or do you proclaim, God says it, so I'll go. And I'll say, when? God says, stand, and I'll stiffen my resolve. God says, we, and he and I, he and us, can accomplish great things. Another thing that can stop us, or one thing that can stop us is our doubts. You see, other people's doubts don't have to stop God from accomplishing what he wants through our lives. Mary and Martha doubted. The mourners doubted. Even the disciples doubted. They just didn't understand what God could do. We may wonder what Jesus is up to, but still not doubt his love and purpose. Isn't it great that we see God working, but don't know what he is up to? I love that, don't you? You know God is working, but I don't see the end of it. I just love not seeing the end. Not. I want to know, God, where are you taking me? Where is this going? How are we getting there? God says, listen, I know you obey. You ever said that to your kid? I know you obey. Why? Because I said so. How many times does God have to say to you, because I said so? Before you realize he is in control, not you. Since God glories through Jesus Christ as a purpose of our lives, the believer, we can hold on our heads high in confidence that we are in God's will no matter how difficult life may get by obeying his word. We could end up in very difficult moments and difficult times because we're obeying God's word, but we know God has us. That is of ultimate importance. In verse 14, there's another so. It says, so then, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. God is letting the so's, God is letting the ifs in our lives happen so that we see him so that we glorify him rather than us and our president or the next president or the, the, the COVID virus or the, the house that we live in or the job that we have or the boss that we like or the boss we don't like. 
He's waiting for us to say, see, it's God. It's God. Verse 14 tells us that God's will will be accomplished. If we will just wait sometimes, if we'll just watch sometimes, if we'll expect the unexpected. There are some things that will block our vision. Our lack of faith. Martha even tried to dress it up a little bit. Did you notice that? Jesus said he will rise. He will, he will rise from the dead. And, and Marith, that Lazarus will rise from the dead. And Martha said, I know in the last days he will be raised up. See, I trust you, God, but I don't trust you to do miraculous things. I, I'll even put a holy spin on it. I know you can do all things, Lord. But do I really believe it? The lack of faith goes into doing way, the things that we've always done it that way. You see, and there, there's a message I've wanted to preach for years and haven't gotten a chance to, but I'm going to preach some of it now. You believe in creation, right? You believe that God created this universe. You believe that when the, when the Israelites walked up to the Red Sea, the Egyptians were, were right behind them, and, and God was standing in the pillar of fire between them. You believe in that, right? It's in the Word. You believe in that. You believe that God caused a mighty rushing wind to part the Red Sea on each side, and the, the, and the Israelites walked through on dry ground. You believe that miracle. You believe that David faced off with this 10-foot giant with a, a stone and hit him in the forehead, knocked him down, and David was able to yield that man's big sword and cut off his head. You believe that God allowed that through David. You, you believe that Elijah, when he had told it not to rain, it didn't rain, and it didn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he was out of food, so he went to this widow woman's home, and this widow woman had some oil and some flour, and, and, she, and she had to, she was just going to make it and die. Finish that last bit of, of flour and bread and, for her and her son and die. And Elijah told her, well, go ahead and make it. And she made it, and that didn't run out. God provided. You believe that, don't you? It's in the Word. You believe that the Son of God came as a baby, born in a manger. That looks too nice. I'm sorry. It was a mess. It was dirty. It was stinking. It was rotted wood. It was uh, ugly straw. It was animals doing everything that they're supposed to do in the stable. You believe that the God of the universe came and he was born in such a place. You believe that, that he was killed on a cross, that, that they stabbed him in the side, that they pierced his, side, his hands and his, his feet, and you believe that he died, and three days later he rose from the dead. To take away, for what reason? Why did he do that? To take away our sins? He took the penalty of our sins on him and washed us clean as soon as we accepted it? You believe he's coming back again and he's going he's gonna to wipe out all the evil that's in this world and start with a new world again? You believe that? You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy if I'm going to believe that God will take care of me if I give him 10%.
the God that created everything can give you what you need to live if you give him what he has asked you for. Oh, man, pastor, that's not fair. It isn't fair. When, when we want our, what we want and somebody told, tells us that it's, it's another way because God says it's another way, it isn't fair to our way of thinking. It's only fair to God's way of thinking. And we need to come around to thinking God's way. Oh. How many expected to hear that this morning? We need to come around to thinking God's way. So we give him 10%, at least. That when his word says us for us to do something, he expects us to do it. There's many times that God doesn't fit our plans. Our plans need to change into God's plans. Our lives need to change into what God wants us to change. God wants us to practice what God wants will sometimes seem impractical to our friends, even to fellow Christians. I remember having a conversation with my brother. Okay, I'm not going to get in trouble. I, <laughs> I remember having a conversation with my brother one time. We were moving from an area that is around my family, and they loved having us near home. And we were supposed to go down to Florida. They didn't like that. And my brother didn't. And this was not the first conversation that I had like that with my brother. Because he just didn't, though he's a Christian, he didn't understand how God can pick up and move people from one place to another, even though the seemingly there was work for them to do there. There are times, and there will be times in all of our lives, maybe even the next couple months or in the next year, that you will have to do something that God wants you to do that doesn't seem to make sense to anybody else but Him. You need to do it. You need to become it. You need to follow it and to obey it because God has something great if you'll just believe in it. Here's one that I or we seem to rely on quite a bit. I, we as a church, have never done it that way before. I or we have never done it that way before. I will declare to you right now that is the words of a lazy Christian, of a lazy person who says, I'm not, I'm un, unbreakable, I'm unpliable. God can't do whatever he wants. He has to do it my way, and my way is the way I'm most comfortable. That's lazy. If you believe that God can do that whole list of things you learn, he can easily change your life and change the way you do things, and you will find great victory in it. Another attitude that could be blocking your vision of God is not doing everything we know to do. God won't tell me what I want. I want, I want him to let me know about my job. I want him to let me know about the person I'm supposed to marry. I want him to let me know about this thing or that thing. I've had people ask me that question. How do you know God's will? And I said, are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you doing his word? If his word says something, you say, I guess I got to believe it. Let's go. Or is there a fight? Is there an argument? Is there a, I'm not going to read that passage again. <laughs> See, I'm going to avoid the book of John because it tells me so many, it tells me this, and I, I'm not going to do it. I'll read, I'll read something else. Are you willing to do it?
do what God says. Are you witnessing? He says, for us to witness. It's obvious, and the Word of God says several times that we are to be making disciples. Are you doing that? Are you allowing God to do that through you? Are you glorifying God? When he does something, are you giving the glory to him, or are you saying, oh, life just goes on? Are you giving? Are you serving? Are you going beyond yourself and what makes you feel comfortable into what God has commanded you to do? He hasn't just suggested. He's commanded. And if we're not willing to do the things he commands us to do that are very black and white, very open to what he says, are, are, are we just waiting for God to come down a lightning bolt and strike us? Are we waiting for some miraculous sign for us to give that 10%? God and God's vision is we're not allowing him to interrupt us. In Acts chapter 6, excuse me, 16 verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout, uh, traveled throughout the land by the Holy Spirit of, excuse me, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Polygra and Glacia. Having been, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word of God in the province of Asia. Now, if, if you will, just transport yourself for a moment. Paul is walking along the road, and he says, there's Asia over there. I want to go and share God's word in Asia because I was told to go throughout preach and teach and make disciples. I want to go to Asia. I'm going to go to Asia. And he starts walking that way, and Holy Spirit comes in front of him and says, nope, don't want you to go yet. So Paul turns around, and he walks away for a while, and then he comes back, and he says, I see that whole area of Asia. I need to go. And he starts walking, Holy Spirit says, nope, don't want you to go yet. Don't you find it interesting that Paul had to be stopped. Paul was so in love with doing the work of God that he kept on doing and kept on witnessing and kept on going and kept on walking and was willing to go into an area that he wasn't ready, familiar with, but said, That's, they, they need Jesus. Let's go. And the Holy Spirit had to stop we live the opposite? Don't many of us live the opposite? Oh, I'll witness to my friend if God comes down with a lightning bolt and hits me and sends me over there. If I am miraculously transported to my, to my neighbor's yard, then, then I'll, oh, I know, I'll wait till my neighbor comes to me and asks me, what about this Jesus character? waiting for permission to do what God has already told us to do. I'd love it if God would have to come to the point in my life and says, stop, I don't want you to do that anymore. Because I would have known that I was doing God's will in the first place. And that I'm so in love with God's, God's will and God's timing and what God is directing me to do that I'm not going to stop. He's going to have to come in and stop me. Are you waiting for, for some divine permission to do what God has already told us to do? I would witness to my neighbor, but God has not told me to. In a godly, go forth and share me with your neighbor. I would serve the church as, but God has not knocked me down with a lightning bolt. 
See, God has already told you to witness to your neighbor, to share in their lives, to give God glory by letting someone else know about his saving grace. You know you are gifted by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? Do you know that you're gifted by the Holy Spirit to do whatever God wants you to do? It says in his word, we have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the, the presence. We have the fruit of the Spirit. We just need to do it. Or are you waiting for tongues of fire to fall on you in the service to begin working? Are you going to be like, like the woman I talked to about opening her house to a Bible study? Sat in her living room. She was miles away from the church. I said, people aren't able to, to come and, and hear the, to, to our church because it's just too far. They're, they're just not willing to drive that 10 miles. Will you, come, will you let them come to your home and open it up for a Bible study? You know what her response was? If someone wants to be saved, then they should come. I wanted to say, but I didn't. Are you nuts? Jesus came from heaven to earth. We can have a few people in your home. What are we waiting for? God told us to do something we should have to, and he should have to intervene to stop us and tell us not to go ahead. That's okay if we stop. Do you wait for Uncle Sam to knock on your door before you buy our taxes? I hope not. Does your car have to run out of gas before you fill up? Husbands don't respond. Does this TV station have to call you up and tell you to turn on your set? Why do we wait for some divine revelation to do what God has told us to do? Maybe we're like our own children who wait for mom and dad to tell them to clean their room or pick up their mess before they surprisingly tell us I didn't know you meant all the time and every day. God told us to be busy serving him, to share the death and resurrection of Jesus with everyone around us, to build one another up, to minister with our talents and to in a world that is desperately trying to fill their emptiness with everything but the God who we have to offer. Are we like Mary and Martha who don't believe that God can do miraculous things? Or are we going to stand and say, you can raise up and do anything you want through me? Let's stand. Heavenly Father, what we've seen in your word through the raising of Lazarus, through the doubts of the people, is that you want to do the miraculous, and you will do it. But if we want to be a part of it, if we want to see your glory, we have to say, wow, Lord, do it. Do it. May our faith, may be, our faith be the size of Jesus' faith not the size of Martha or Mary. May we be willing not only to die for you, but to live for you. That in this coming year, we will see your work. We will see your hand. We will walk right into what you're doing and say, Lord, what can I do to help? Bring us alongside you. May we see your miracles happen. In 
Jesus' name. Amen. As you're leaving today, we thank you for coming. And we pray that you would uh, take, see the boxes in the back. If you have tithes or offering, please put your tithe and offering in the boxes in the back so that we can uh, see the work of God and the hand of God through your gifts. Thank you.